Okay, great to have now a special guest today with us. Uh, Tim, uh, Tim, uh, you're actually, how do you pronounce? Werner? Werner? Wagner, depending on how yeah. German you are. <laughs> yeah, we're, I'm pretty close to German, uh, but, uh, you know, in, in speaking, uh, I'm, I'm more in ordering, I'm Wiener Schnitzel and, and so I, uh, a beer, uh, uh, and then I slowly finish my German. Yeah. <laughs> I, sh I should know better in, in, in Europe. Uh, great, great to have you here. I mean, uh, when I was reading uh, about you, I was really, uh, really, really impressed by uh, you know, comments of how much people are uh, having great things to say about, you know, as hyper connector, as, as Harvard lecturer, and this is where I get prepared because I was also teaching there, so I get some of my mentors you know, and books uh, getting ready there. Uh, yeah, um, Howard Stevenson was my mentor, so I was on program for professors, so quite a lot of chats, visiting him at home, and, and uh, it was interesting. But uh, yeah, uh, good with, with uh, Tim Werner. We're going to start with um, going over the five animals that we prepared today. You now, going uh, moving from black swan theory from Asim Talib, uh, uh, talking about the uh, changes in, in a global way, not just in industry. Moving then, uh, predicting how to move fast forward, not only because the world is turning faster than you ever uh, could imagine, especially in COVID time. And uh, we're going to talk also about the marketplace. So how to find the Blue Lagoon. Kim Chan made a great book, you know, about Blue Ocean, but we are mostly fighting with sharks, you know, and more in Red Ocean. So finding here the, the right market. I'm going to touch the base with uh, unicorns and other. Uh, I heard today also we have uh, gray rhinos and, and uh, zebras and many other animals, you know, dinosaurs, you know, on some forest list. And uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I love the book also. Uh, uh, my, my kids love uh, Purple Cow, you know, on Milka uh, chocolates, but I'm talking here more about Seth Godin, kind of the differentiation, you know, to see how different we can uh, make the products or services, you know, to differentiate. And most important, uh, the last one is the oldest theory about the uh, butterfly wings. So we're gonna talk about how personally we can influence all this to, to finish the circle in a way how individual can uh, influence the world, even stock exchange and many other things. So, yeah. Um, so to start with the first one, you know, and then the blacks, you know, the moving fast forward, which trends do you see outside your industry or how to define your industry or if you can present yourself, you know, and then we can start with, with the global. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many different places I could start with that, but I, I would say probably the one that's most uh, relevant to sort of my career, uh, you know, in dealing with startups and corporates and, and innovation and technology is that, um, you know, for a long time, technology was seen as this very esoteric field, um, you know, it kind of started out in Silicon Valley, really focused on like um, silicon chips, moved into kind of the personal computing um, and then internet. And so we've seen these waves. Now we have like crypto with the Coinbase IPO today. Um, you know, and I think generally people always would talk about the tech industry. But, you know, when people say that, I'm, I'm, I'm like, nowadays, I'm like, what do you mean by tech industry? Like, isn't every industry tech now? I mean, when you think about what's the leading car company, Tesla, I mean, you know, like you didn't, we didn't used to think of like automobiles as necessarily a tech company, you know, or uh, HR companies, you know. Uh, um, so there, basically uh, my premise, you know, for going back 10 years was really that like every industry is tech or will be tech. Uh, exactly. and, and by extension, every company is a tech company or, or if it's not a tech company, it either has to become a tech company or it probably won't exist. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And the kind of extending this to within the organization, you know, for a long time, the, for the folks who, you know, dealt with technology and innovation, you usually like this, you know, the CTO. Uh, or the CIO, you know, the, or head of IT, if it's more old school um, language, you know. Um, but, you know, I, I think we started seeing, you know, a number of years ago changing where, well, really, actually, every leader needs to be technically proficient and understand technology and how it plays. Even if you're the CFO, you have to understand how, um, what technology you can use to, you know, balance, um, you know, the, uh, your bottom line and grow your top line and, and operate your organization and things like that. HR, same thing. You have to be um, a kind of a tech leader uh, and yeah. HR, you know, for recruiting, retention, reskilling, um, you know, and CEO has to tie all those things together. Um, and, but like, really, like, I, I guess, you know, going back a number of years, like my, 
my thinking was always quite um, more radical was saying, well, actually every person, every role is a tech role, um, no matter what you do. I mean, even if you are like, you know, a barista at Starbucks, you have to interface with like order, you know, digital order menus and uh, you have to deal with digital payments um, and things like that. And so really it's like every, everything is tech now. How do we talk about it? So, um, and, and, and then by, and because of that, that is why like those areas have been huge growth areas because they're essentially subsuming everything that was what you would consider non-tech, which is more, you know, manual processes and paper driven processes. All, all that whole world is disappearing and pretty soon it won't, I don't think we'll talk about the tech industry really in, in the same way anymore. Agree. We don't, we don't have that concept. It's, it's like a media company, you know, today every every company is on top, they are a media company, but they have that page or Facebook or even Clubhouse, yeah. you know, it's just there, yeah. it should be, you know, yeah. kind of standard. That's, that's a great example, especially in marketing. So, you know, I worked for um, Accenture, I helped stood up Accenture yeah, Venture, okay. open yeah. innovation team. And, um, you know, like when Accenture started moving into essentially the ad agency space, you know, the big, the big ad agencies really didn't take Accenture seriously. They thought, oh, like you're a system integrator, you're a management consulting company, yeah. we don't have to worry about you. But actually Accenture has been like, I think now like four or, four or five years running is like the largest, you know, digital agency in the world. Um, yes. Ad agencies didn't see them coming because they came from a technology standpoint and they moved down into branding and marketing. The problem is for an ad agency to move upstream into technology yeah. is much harder, actually. So yes. Venture was really well positioned and got its timing really well and actually aggressively going into the space and saying we can we can win in the digital marketing space and digital experience space um, because it's, it's actually converging with uh, software and hardware elements. Uh, and we're and that's actually much harder to be good at. Um, and so, you know, they bought Fjord and that really um, slingshotted them ahead. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, now, now they're sort of one of the leading, um, leading companies for that. Yeah, great. You're, you're having so many hats. So it's really interesting then to see that all the perspectives, you know, working with startups, you know, I also started there many years ago. I wrote the first book about venture capital in 2001. At that time, actually before that, we were searching because in Europe, it's not so common, you know, to, to talk about angels and business in VC, you know, something that we, where we have in Silicon Valley daily, you know, operating, yeah. but um, it's it's really developing much faster now in Europe, trying, trying to catch up, you know, all the Asia, you yeah. know, gets in front of us in, in the US, of course, it's leading, yeah. but uh, yeah, all, all this is powering also uh, 360 uh, degree view that you have. So from Accenture perspective, uh, start the percent, but also investor. You know th that's cap is also interesting. Uh, that you do you see any changes also globally? You know in, in getting world smaller in a way. Like there's Kickstarter, there are platforms, you know, where also investors and projects that are getting more yeah. globalized. Yeah, I mean, actually, this is something that I'm quite passionate about, and and you know has kind of made me very optimistic about kind of the future and and the speed by which things could change in a um, positive manner. You know, I spent a lot of my career in Japan and. Um, you know, it's funny, like people would always, you know, have this image of Japan as being a place that's only good at like taking good ideas and making them better, you know, like basically continuous improvement, like Kaizen mentality of like Toyota. Um, but, you know, it's never been true. I mean, they invented basically the bullet train, like, and they invented a lot of things like, you know, you know Sony and Toyota, a lot of their innovations were very fresh. I mean, so it's like saying Japanese people aren't creative is crazy. Um, but the thing is, the business culture and structure and format of that didn't really allow for it. There wasn't enough vitality and dynamism like in um, the um, that kind of uh, company culture. And there also wasn't like a path for young people to go and start businesses. You just, <clears throat> your, your parents would just, you know, want you to go work for a big company, yeah. you know, which used to be the case in the US. I mean, even there's, there's that kind of um, thread. Um, but I think the things that we're seeing is that, again, going back to technology, there's a positive feedback loop between technology creating the framework um, and that actually allows more technology to come out. And so we've seen that like, you know, with, you know, uh, you can look at Y Combinator, um, or, you know, nowadays like Beyond Deck, uh, where there's actually software layer and platform and community building is actually supporting and accelerating um, um, people's ability to think about themselves as entrepreneurs. Uh, and actually some of the areas that I've been most excited about in investing is actually related to this because um, you know, back, I, I used to work for uh, Osaka University, it's one of the top research universities in, uh, in the world, you know, kind of, uh, you know, one of the top ones in Japan. And, um, 
you know, the, one of the things they were trying to, uh, to do is that, you know, they did a lot of great basic research, um, but like a lot of universities, and I work with the University of California system, same thing was happening was okay. a lot of great basic research, but um, they would just do the research and then publish the paper and then move on to their next project. Yeah. Yeah. They would leave it to someone else to do the application. And, you know, sometimes someone would find the patent or would find the research and be like, let's build a, a commercial product on it. But, you know, more, most often, you know, thousand to one, that just disappeared into a black hole uh, yeah. and, and, and nothing, no, no commercial application ever came out of it. Nothing practical came out of yeah. it. Yeah. Now you see this interesting thing where you have, you know, science, biologists and um, MDs and all these other people used to stay in academia are actually now going and becoming founders yeah and that never used to be the case these are deep not like domain experts and they're saying i want to make the world I, I believe the world can be like this someone needs to actually create the product that enables that and so you see more and more people actually leaving um uh you know academia or you know even government things and starting companies with the idea that that is actually one of the better um, um faster better ways to change the world uh and i can, that gives me a lot of optimism for our future, especially in healthcare and, and energy and things like this, where you see these people used to just really focus on like, you know, you know, the more the paper producing papers. Now they're actually producing things that we use and buy, which is replacing the old world and at a faster pace. Um, so I think that's where we see this, you know, awesome flywheel effect of technology mm -hmm. and, and frameworks, methodologies, and just language inventing yeah. the words for people to describe and, and think of themselves differently and, and imagine a different world where they are actually the ones driving the world. And that's really exciting. Yeah, when you mentioned MedTech, it just reminded me, uh, I'm, I'm proud that the, you were just published on, uh, in Forbes on Saturday uh, with, with telemedicine article that we developed for uh, technology, artificial intelligence power that Mayo Clinic is using. You know? So it, it's uh, about FemTech. It's interesting that also a female engineer was working, a female founder and female doctor, you know? Everything was kept um, uh, femtech uh, organized, but they, it's interesting case. You know, they they all connected together. Yeah? And yeah, like you said, it's it's moving fast. Also, many in many markets. So, which trends do, do you see then? Um, let's say also on the markets. Now we, we touch the medicine. Are there some big changes? Do you see will happen in the industries, or it's more like global influence on in all these industries. So let's say, what are the biggest changes in, in your market or in your industry, if you can uh, you know, yeah. put that yeah. in one? one uh, there's, yeah. yeah, there's so many ways to answer that. I mean, one one is beyond like more, more diversity of um, types mm -hmm. of people and backgrounds thinking, uh, okay. actually becoming founders. That's, that's becoming a global phenomenon now because there's a lot of copycats, you know, for Y Combinator or, you know, um, yes. and, and some of the other structures for entrepreneurship and accelerators and things like that. Um, but also it's a, the geographic dispersal, like before everything sort of had to happen in Silicon Valley. And it's still like sort of the epicenter, the, you know, the white hot core of innovation is still, still um, largely Silicon Valley, but you see lots of other places springing up now doing really interesting things. You know, some are uh, specializing in specific AI, like, you know, you have places like, you know, Toronto, Montreal and Paris, like are doing really interesting things in AI or, you know, have blockchain, um, you know, for technology. And then you have different industries. There may be different um, nexuses of that. You know, biotech's always been like really um, a lot of focus on the East Coast. Um, and we see more dispersal um, um, geographically, which is good because there can only be so many people who can live in Silicon Valley at the end of the day. Exactly. And yeah. the reality is, you know, although we love to like, you know, so here in Silicon Valley be like, well, we're living two or three years in the future, which is true, uh, just to a large extent. Um, you get in a bubble of like not always um, actually having contact with the uh, today's world, which is the on ramp for everyone else. <laughs> so you need to have that on ramp to everyone else or you won't get user adoption. Right. Um, so that, you know, that's a, a big deal. And, and kind of like you know, circling back, you know, this is maybe a way to pull together your previous question too, which is like, I guess, kind of the heart of it is um, what is getting made uh, and how is it getting made and, and who's paying for it? Um, yeah. Because there's a lot of fields that were um, really um, impossible to enter before because the barriers to entry were just too expensive. And those are dropping quite a bit. Like you see this in biology with you know, the advent of CRISPR and, and other tools. Um, you see it in terms of like um, on-demand um, uh, 
uh, additive manufacturing, so like 3D printing, you know, not, not just like in plastics, but in metals and um, all kinds of really interesting tool sets um, that are enabling, like the picks and shovels of the, of the you know, the yeah. old brush, like it's enabling a lot of other people to do interesting things. You see this on the code side, lots of code libraries, APIs and infrastructure companies, you know, those are multi-billion dollar companies um, that are kind of the building the pipes so that other people don't have to go build payment systems or APIs or, you know, texting, texting things or authorization, you know, identity um, layers and stuff. You can just go in and basically take all the components off the shelf and you can build something a lot faster that's scalable. Uh, and I think that's enabling a lot of amazing stuff. So, the, so getting, so being able to build something has become cheaper, um, which is great. Um, because it's hard to find VC money, you, have, you know, especially when you're bootstrapping. But like, there's been an explosion in diversification. I, it's almost like a, a Cambrian explosion on the on the finance side too. Like capital is really getting yes. interesting, and traditional VC are getting really squeezed if they're not creative or adding something um, really differentiated um, from the, what VC used to look like. They're probably not going to be around in a few years. They're not going to be able to raise funds because. I mean, hedge funds and private equity guys are moving down from the public markets into the private markets very aggressively, like you see KOTU and like Tiger, um, you know, going down into the B and even earlier rounds now. Um, you see solo capitalists, um, you know, going, doing their own funds, rolling funds, angel list, angel. reg CF changes with, you know, Republic, now you can raise $5 million a year. I mean, then you have like Pipe, which is doing like um, financing based on your uh, recurring revenue which is basically, you don't have to take equity and you're just borrowing against your future revenue. I mean, there's so many really fascinating things to do. Models that, also, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can, you can accelerate faster and, and the amount of time it takes you to actually close that money is actually changing. Cause you know, sometimes founders would take six months and dedicating all their time just to try to find the money to finance the product. And then during that time, they're not focusing on the product as much. So I think this is a really uh, um, positive um, advancement. And, and I think we're at this, yeah, I mean, it's going to be really fascinating to see what we see, because this is really new too. I mean, you're talking like in the really in the last year or two, a lot of people were caught, caught flat-footed, um, you know, who weren't paying attention in the VC world. Yeah. Uh, amazing. Uh, I agree. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, if, if you conclude, try to conclude actually here, it's not only about one bl uh, blue lagoon, you know, that's changing uh, in a way of value innovation, but it's happening that there's multiple, Actually, lagoons that are that are right, right uh, jump popping out, let's say, in, in the field that we never expected. You know, and like exactly yeah. like you said, it's not only on the product and services, but the whole ecosystem of it. Now, I was uh, when I was researching for a PhD in two thousand two uh, seven at that time, and I was uh, predicting actually this crowdfunding before it happened. So for me, because I started working with Y Combinator in two seven, I met them in uh, two six. I met them first time in two seven in in London. And then we were discussing, you know, and it was really abstract ideas at that time. And then we were predicting actually that if, if there's common number of startups, you know, there could be even market to market of ideas and, and money in, in, in a way. So uh, many, many possibilities to finance now, but it's only question also how do we bring good ideas, you know, like how do we bring good companies and, and the right speed uh, to this. So here, here I'm touching also the, the question on uh, third animal, on, on the unicorn. So let's say there could be many, like we said, uh, many sh shapes or types of companies, but we'd like to hear maybe a, a project that you're really most proud of, you know, working uh, working on. on in, I mean, there's many of them, I believe there's limited time, but what would you like to expose? Which, which project is close to your heart? Oh, well, I guess the question is like stuff I'm working on or the things that I'm aware of that are going on that I'm excited by. Yes. <laughs> which one? Which one did you want me to focus uh, on? I feel like I could go down a rabbit hole either one. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Probably the latest one will be will be a most a most uh, how to say your most passionate about. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I've definitely ramped up um, like some of my angel investing like last year, um, and so like there's a lot of uh, amazing um, kind of companies I've, I'm advising and investing. And for me, like, you know, as an angel investor, like I'm, it's, it's always about more than the money. It's like, what can I, how can I help founders, um, you know, get and survive and thrive? Like what is, what do they need help with in terms of, they don't have an experience in this area. They need product feedback. Um, they need partners, customers, um, key hires, trying to raise more money. So I'm always trying to help them where they're at, you know, cause I've been in, you know, the Valley 16 years. So I've, you know, got wow. quite a yeah. work I can tap for that. So, I mean, I, I'd say probably the one 
you know, again, like talking about like optimism, you know, there's in, in, you know, with climate change, it's been a steady drumbeat of bad news, really like, you know, getting worse and worse every year. Um, but, you know, I, I've become much more optimistic in this last year or two, um, seeing the level of talent and capital and ideas and um, just products that are really advanced in their technology uh, and really scale ready. Uh, and importantly, very and sustainable um, business-wise. Um, yep. And you didn't really see all of these things coming coming together before. So like I've invested in a bunch of companies around, you know, around, around climate change, you know, with direct air capture. So taking carbon out of the area or, um, you know, uh, electric vehicles and battery technology, um, and, you know, or other areas that are sort of tangentially related to climate change, um, you know, like, you know, uh, modular housing, which produces a lot less waste uh, and can be a lot more energy efficient. Um, uh, and other, you know, kind of ways to rethink uh, like how we um, how we build and what we use, because um, you know most of us are used to certain um, standard of living, and it's the replacement to that has to be relatively the same level of standard of living, yes. but come with all these extra benefits. Kind of looking for that 10x improvement on how do we reduce um, our carbon emissions, or you know, ideally, how do you go carbon neutral, or even better, carbon negative. Um, because we're at a point where we have to be carbon negative. Other Even better, yeah. yeah. The ship has been moving in the wrong direction for a long time. And, <laughs> you know, the, like, they, like they always say, it takes a long time to move an oil tanker. Well, think about how long it's going to take to move an entire planet from the direction it's been moving for 50 years. Yeah. Um, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of people pulling in a lot of different areas. It's not just about startups. I mean, I think government has a huge, huge place to play to set yes. the ground rules, to encourage innovation, to seed things. Um, um, and you see that a lot in California. So all really great things, especially with the Biden administration uh, um, and the new secretary of energy, you know, who I was emailing with, like, you know, they're doing some really fascinating things and um, really smart people who um, aren't normal, just bureaucrats. Like they, they get the place of technology, they get the place of how can public and private play together in a, yes. in a, in a good way where, you know, it's not the government just picking the winners, but how do you actually create the environment? Like you were saying, the ecosystem, it's all goes back to environment and the bio biology. How can you create an environment where, you know, you, you incent the right kind of behaviors, the right kind of outcomes um, without necessarily trying to pick the, which organism is going to survive through that yeah. environment, <laughs> um, which is like a fool's there and even VC get this wrong. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's an area like, you know, a large area I'm generally really passionate yeah. about um, in terms of the investing side. Um, I've actually been ramping down my investment side and, in, in, personally getting more um been focusing a lot more on the social space um mm -hmm. this is another area it's like climate change it's been building up all this bad stuff's been building up for a while and i think people are just ready for change uh and looking for something but they don't know what they're looking for like yeah. they need something to grab onto and i've had some ideas around the space and so now i mean i have a company uh, in stealth mode right now that's basically working on something to um to try to address this and try to reimagine the world you know from first principle about how do we how do we actually um interact with the people in our life socially like how do we how can we just spend more time with the people we care about how can we enable that with technology in, in a way that's not intrusive or extractive um yeah. the way that the attention economy is uh, and is actually healthier for us mentally <laughs> as well. Uh, so that's, that's what I've been working on. Haven't fully taken the wraps off of that, but I've uh, been spending literally years thinking about this and now kind of trying to, um, you know, focus this into uh, a beta um, product, basically. Great. Putting all together. Yeah. We can help you and we can help you there. We'll, we'll talk later. But uh, actually, I, I figured uh, I had last week, I had uh, my MBA class, for example, from France. Um, it's global, but from a uh, French school, uh, ESCA. And I can tell you that 80% of students were really building the projects, but I'm, I was pretty surprised, you know, on, on undergrad, it's, it's understand, but on MBA, uh, we're building the projects that were having impact, uh, exactly what you said, on, on this industry. So focusing, they could choose any industry they want, you know, but they were, they were selecting actually how to make a positive change to the world, you know, how to make carbon footprint. One, one team made uh, planned hotels, you know, how to make a Planned hotels or renting, you know, interesting stories. You know how they build up, how they came up with ideas. I give them very short time, but uh, it's it's. Uh, I would say exactly what you said. It's, it's the wave that we have to build. You know, a better world in in this direction. Uh, unless uh, there's only not much space for our kids and and uh, you know, 
grand, uh, grand, uh, yeah. grand gifts. Yeah. I mean, or uh, ourselves. I mean, I mean, the thing is, yeah. I, I, a lot of the climate change, we always talk about the future, but I'm like, I live in California and like we had yes. like, I mean, the smoke was ridiculously bad from the fires, the wildfires for like a uh, year. I mean, to be honest, like that's not all climate change related. It's mostly uh, forest management problems. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Our, our approach to not letting anything burn in a place that it actually naturally tends to burn even before humans were here. Um, and so, you know, there's a, but it's convergence of the problems, I'll put it that way. Yeah. And, and, and that affects us today. I mean, this is like, I would always say like one of the reasons China is so far ahead of us in, in, in this area is because, well, guess what? The billionaires and the leaders of that company don't like breathe and smog any more than the poor people do. Yeah, like, yeah. They're highly incented to change their thing and they have the, the hands on the levers so they can they can pull those levers and that's what they've been doing. We haven't been doing that here. Maybe, I don't know, maybe just because we solved some, some of the really bad um, smoggy air, we, we kind of fixed that a little bit in the 70s and, and we've had some emission controls, but you know, a lot of the problem now is a lot of a lot of the bad stuff is something that's been more or less invisible until things start burning or, you know, the water dries up like and then it's kind of hard to ignore uh, at that point. Yeah. And that's it definitely uh, will double down. That's that's uh, one of the questions that I have also, you know, it, which things will double down in in, uh, in in globally. It's very clear. What do you see uh, what companies should double down also? Is that also in this direction to make a positive change or how to, how to speed up, let's say, in, in, the, in the process that companies are now? Yeah, I mean, actually, this has been the really interesting thing is that everyone has been waiting like 10 years for um, countries to really institute like a global car carbon market. I mean, in, uh, the EU sort of been there, California sort of there, but it's, it's pretty fragmented. And, and so it hasn't really, you know, it's like very piecemeal. And, um, you know, it's also very opt in, like, you know, co companies could do it or not do it. Some companies were had, had to and others, it was more like a, I wouldn't say a PR move, but it's sort of like, you know, it was a nice to have, it wasn't a must have. Uh, and I think people have been waiting for that. And I think the carbon market still could happen, but we're, we're kind of moving into this weird space where like, in a way, private companies are actually leading the way now. Um, yeah. And you look at this, like, you know, Microsoft, you know, they, they've committed to, um, essentially offsetting all of the carbon they've ever produced in the history of their company. I mean, like you're talking about billions of dollars of investment. This is not a small play. And there's multiple companies like this that are doing it, or Amazon committing to doing like all electric vehicle um, 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 delivery van fleet, you know, with their um, deal with Rivian, with, you know, buying 100,000 Rivian trucks um, and, uh, you know, or Stripe, you know, it's like a payments company you know, they're actually yes. baking into their API now where like you can do a carbon offset, like, you know, it's baked into it. Like, um, and, you know, the work that they're doing over there is really amazing. Or just the general, like the Amazon's um, um, uh, climate pledge, you know, they're, they've been onboarding lots of Fortune 500 companies to basically um, pledge to reduce or eliminate their carbon emissions and have a plan. And now there's other companies that are, are providing, they're are emerging to actually provide the solutions to that. Um, I think we're actually quickly moving to a period where there's going to be a bottleneck where there's not enough ways to actually offset the carbon uh, <laughs> take it out of the air. Like I actually almost see the demand is going to be greater than the supply, uh, especially around like um, verified carbon removal, which is a big problem. And yes, there's yes. I've invested in companies actually solving this, like Nori. They're trying to put it on the blockchain because fraud is a you know double selling of carbon yes. credits is, is a problem, and and actually proving that you actually remove um, um, prevented um, carbon emissions and things. It's not not an easy problem to solve, but a lot of people there's a lot of money washing around now. You know, you're talking this is a multi billion dollar um, thing, and then when you put energy on top of that, you're talking multiple multi trillion dollars. It's, it's it doesn't get markets don't get any bigger than energy. <laughs> exactly. when you think about it. Uh, other than other than water, the the major component that we need in life is energy. Wow! Yeah, I agree. Um, it's it's really uh, you put down uh, great, you know, energy, energy, water, and when we adjust the passion, you know, of people, you know, we, we create uh, great things together. Yeah? Uh, it's it's also I, I think uh, one of the uh, when I talk about this animal uh, uh, company animal, let's say uh, I talk also many times about the speed. There's Always there was uh, for let's say top hundred companies, you know, that you're looking as the biggest companies, as the most successful companies. On the other hand, when you talk about speed, in 2004 there was the first unicorn that was that started, you know, and at that time they made uh, they said you know it's statistical mistake almost, you know, in the economy. Mm -hmm. yeah, but today, um, I believe this week there was 
611 unicorns already with a value of $2 billion uh, actually and growing at such a pace that more than 100 new unicorns were built up last three months, evaluated, let's say. And yeah. for me, it was like 100 in three months. And the first one was just, you know, 15 years, 15 years ago. So it's, it's the speed and, and the, the, that uh, also is changing the list in a way of, of the biggest or most important. I see that actually not the big fish is eating the small, but actually the fast, uh, fast uh, uh, fish is eating the slow, you know, in, in a way. It's more important just, you know, to move in the right direction and, and uh, swim fast than how big the, the company is. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think you make a lot of good points there. I, I mean, I don't get so caught up on the unicorn thing, because sometimes I feel like that's like a little bit of a vanity metric. Um, yeah. Honestly, like, you know, founders were kind of compute like and compete to like, they want to be able to say they're a unicorn. I don't necessarily think it's always the best, you know, signal of value or potential growth or things like sure. that. It's, 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 to be honest, increasingly, it's a function of the fact that there's so much capital available looking for places to invest yes. and that's driving the valuations like crazy. I mean, the valuations, you, you, I mean, you know, VC have been around a while, just think that the valuations are like crazy, like, you know, really crazy, like you know, that these early stage companies are just, the, the ticket sizes are getting so big uh you know and the valuations are are zooming and that's actually that's dangerous because like we see this you know we got a little lucky with sort of the markets in the last two years um because even good companies with good fundamentals were having problems because they got overvalued in the private market and that actually can be an existential threat to uh even a later stage company because it may make it really difficult to raise the the next round and you may run out of money theoretically um you have we haven't seen it a ton but like it could have happened if things had gone the wrong way with the macroeconomics so like it's been um really interesting you saw airbnb they almost they almost yes. had that problem they i mean they, they silver lake gave a bunch of money they they you know they basically their valuation bobbled <clears throat> they recovered because they're, you know, they're fundamentally an awesome company. You know, like my friend Nate's the co-founder. I mean, he's that they're just awesome founders. It's an awesome company. I love, I, I love using it, but I mean, wouldn't it have been sad if like, you know, that's such a product went away because of the way the company been valued. Um, and we actually see this more um, frequently in the earlier stage. Like, you know, if you're a series A or C or something, you're more likely to get caught in this valuation trap where you're overvalued uh, on paper, but your company's still good. Um, but you know, and that what a horrible re reason to fail, right? Is because of the capitalization problem. And so uh, I always coach, you know, startups I invest, and I'm like, don't take money if you don't need it. Don't don't exactly. reach for the unicorn status if you don't need it. That's not that's actually ultimately not that important, and actually can hurt you in ultimately getting to where you want, which is building something that lasts, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, because even if you're not the CEO anymore and you go off to your exactly. you know, island Bahama. You still want to see that company going on because you poured your sweat and blood into it. And, um, you know, people start companies for reasons, right? And it's, it's the idea, yeah. seeing the idea come to life. Uh, so I think I think that th those are some of the things like I, I guess like, I, you know, I've been saying is that um, that there is a lot of frothiness in the market. You know, there's 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 a combined like the stuff I was saying earlier. It's easier to start a company. More people are starting companies, more types of people are starting companies. Um, and a lot of um, areas that have been really resistant to innovation uh, are now finally cracking open, like, you know, construction industry, healthcare, um, you know, uh, cross-border payment, like a lot of stuff that was heavily regulated and was like, it's sort of, you know, consumer is always easy. B2C, consumer game, stuff like yeah, that's yeah. easy because you don't, there's so little regulatory stuff around. You can easily come along and make a big company, but the bigger stuff um, is harder to do. And I mean, that's why, to be honest, Coinbase is winning because since day one, they were very focused on playing by the rules that the SEC had already established and, and making themselves to be as a very trusted in kind of conservative crypto company. Yes. Um, and, and that's and it won. I mean, that's why they won, because that was the thing is people, if you don't trust a company, you're not going to put your money there and keep your money there. And especially when it comes to, like, you know, large institutional like um, holdings, like, you know, they're, they've been doing, you know, kind of uh custody for institutions like a lot of people if you look at their you know as one like a lot of the revenue actually is is, is increasingly coming from companies Corporate. Um, actually yeah. or institutional investors i should say and um actually putting their money into coinbase and that's a huge vote of confidence and i think that's why coinbase is going to be around for a long time um, yeah. and plus the retail stuff that's just you know those are just a kicker in a way 
it's it's uh, yeah great to see i i helped uh, actually i was meeting with with uh, crypto in 2014 you know presenting some young guys you know they were starting something like coin at that time you know and and they came out, out later with uh, i believe 63rd uh, coin that was launched uh, at that time and economical and uh, uh, you know how how shocking it was you know even not just for students but even for professors you know to, to understand you know what will happen and now today when we talk about you know, bitcoin and all the system you know it's it's already looks like it's there for for you know for years and uh, it's it's really uh, start shifting uh, this in this period of time you know in the, in the latest especially when it's growing when it's falling down you know nobody wants to talk much you know but when it's growing it's it's a kind of gold rush like you said um good and and this is also touching the the base with um the the next uh, animal let's say to call it uh, from Seth Godin uh, I took the purple cow you know how to fast forward you know the product the the let's say service that we are talking how to make it different I really like uh, the case how he was using uh, uh one of the cases was like imagine that that the drinks would be you know that, that you put taste of food in the drinks you know well how, how different it is you know we don't want to taste a drink uh, called a christmas dinner you know but it was success on the market for, for one company for uh john soda for example and uh, it's it's how to build different things and here's maybe a question also for you uh do you prefer doing since you're investing also in b2b or b2c or something else how, how do you see the the market that you prefer i think i think with technology sometimes there's a blend like there's a lot of things that are you know combination you know yeah. kind of b to c to b right like i mean think about square you know right i yeah. you know people use square from a retail uh you know direct uh, uh, consumer perspective but they also have the small business component which, which interfaces with the consumer so it's like you know where do you put that there's i think some of the most interesting companies are the ones that are in between stripes the same thing like i mean well is stripe b2b because like now actually you have people like baking like people who are baking that into all kinds of products that are you know you know that are quite um interesting and you know around payments and stuff you know influencers and um you know especially with you know you see this with blockchain um i think that i think you know getting to what you know seth was talking about um i think it's really stepping back because i think we get so trained by what is that sometimes we forget what might be or what mm -hmm. could be. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and, and I think that's one of the magics of Silicon Valley that I don't think people talk enough about is that because you're surrounded by so many companies on the bleeding edge and you're oftentimes the guinea pig, you're the first adopter just by the nature of yes. living in San Francisco that like, you know, when I go back to Vermont where I'm from and sometimes I realize I've been living two years in the future. And I tell my, you know, my family about staying at someone, on, you know, in someone's house on Airbnb and, and calling an app on Uber and they think I'm crazy. And but then two or three years later, they get it because they're using it. Uh, it just takes time to reach them. Um, yes. Being surrounded by all this stuff is great because it keeps you thinking in the future about what else could be. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, Silicon Valley has been such a font of, of innovation, because it, it's like, what else could I do? Or like, what if we did that, but in a different space? Like, I mean, that's, there's been a lot of this stuff, um, you know, where you just basically copycat, um, you know, and you see even serial entrepreneurs sometimes do this in their career. Like they're basically taking the same basic business model that they optimize in one place and they're bringing it to another place. Um, you know, you saw this, um, uh, like, you know, I think it was with Trulia and um, uh, TripAdvisor and Glassdoor. Guess what? There is a thread of people connected to all three of those. And it's all the same thing. It's like, you know, the um uh user generated content basically right that's what it's about it's basic the same basic um structure but attacking different areas of you know uh you know recruiting and uh travel uh and um you know uh housing and stuff like that and so i think there's there's an there's an interesting um thread through that and so one of the things that i'm really passionate about is you know like i was mentioning is the really social space because i think we've we've been using facebook so long now in Twitter that, um, you know, these products were very novel when they came out and they really created this whole new space, you know, the social media space, right, was defined yes. by them, that we, we, our muscles have atrophied. We don't realize, like, actually what we could have. We're, we just get used to what they give us. Uh, and I think this is, I, I think this is kind of realization was sort of dawning on me slowly, um, you know, when just thinking about Facebook. Think about how Facebook has redefined the word friend. I mean, yeah. 
And the older, I mean, right? Like, I mean, friend is a very nebulous term. It's like in, in Facebook's definition, it's like anyone that you've met, <laughs> yeah, right? But that's I... not actually a friend from a, from, a, from a traditional sense of defining the word. And it's not to say that's necessarily bad in all things because, you know, someone who's a stranger can become your friend. So, you know, that's natural progression, but, but also it, it, there's, we lose something in the process because by not defining that, when we don't set constraints, um, we actually, um, we ourselves don't, aren't as good of a friend potentially, um, you know, or vice versa. We feel like we're not, we're missing something from our friendships because Facebook is actually training us our behavior in subtle ways that we're not realizing that are not good for us actually. And that we actually are dissatisfied with, but we haven't really identified it because we don't know what, uh, what else, the, what else could be. Uh, we become so used options, to that yeah. um, but the great thing about technology and innovation is that once you show somebody a new world, it's really hard for them to forget it. Um, it's, it's hard to unthink something. And so I think that's, that's the thing that gives me a lot of um, uh, kind of optimism about the future. It's like, well, what does that future look like that isn't social media, but is still um, in a, a, a value like intermediary between our relationships that we have? Uh, and so this is something I've been thinking a lot about for, you know, for multiple years now. And thinking about how what what could that look like going back to first principles about why did we even start using facebook and yeah. do we actually feel do we get that same feeling we used to get from facebook i don't i don't i, I don't know about you but i don't feel that way yeah, <laughs> and yeah. so i feel like there's um and there's even stuff that facebook used to do that they don't do that i used to love and stuff that i always wondered why don't they do x um and so i think there's a uh, there's a lot of that you know in, in talking to many of my friends and and just other people um, there seems to be a, a building consensus of building dissatisfaction with that space, um, that there is some utility in what they're doing, but it's not, there's, there's space for a lot more actually. Yeah. Do you see, do you see Clubhouse just, uh, you know, intermediate question as uh, differentiating enough, you know, is it enough to build uh, the, let's say additional, uh, big story, you know, next to Facebook, Instagram, you know, all other social media, it's audio enough. I'm sorry, I don't. I don't think I quite caught, caught your you know, uh, question. Clubhouse, Clubhouse. You know, it's using the oh, audio. Clubhouse. Let's say Clubhouse. Yeah. yeah. So, um, is is it different enough? You know, to build to to compete. Let's say with with the big social yeah, media. I think yeah, yeah. Clubhouse occupies a very interesting space. Um, yeah, I agree. I think yeah. What they're doing is, is fundamentally unique. Um, I think I think it is going to be challenging for them because like Twitter sort of is almost more optimized to be doing yeah, what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, Twitter Spaces something. is actually quite solid um, competitor, and they actually have a much bigger foundation. But Clubhouse may have gotten enough like momentum um, to have some escape velocity and to exist by itself. Um, but I think actually Clubhouse's main um, kind of innovation is sort of on the format level because. Um, you know, basically, like most of the clubhouses I've been to tend to, really tend to be around affinity groups and um, some topic um, or personality related to that topic is talking about something. And it's like kind of like going to a, an a, like a in-person event and listening to someone talk about some, some really smart people talk about something you care about, um, except it's even more conversational and yes. there's less, less like um, of that all the annoying parts of events like you know <laughs> like where's where's the restroom and thanks our thanks thanks to our sponsors and and yeah. and all that crap is like totally discarded uh <laughs> and you're getting pure content and it's more casual you feel like you're just eavesdropping into this con dinner conversation because of the nature it's such the audio nature is there's no video i think yeah. it just makes people relax more um and so there's that component the psychological component and the logistical component but then there's the um the, just the format structure of um, you know, normal, it's essentially a panel, right? Like it's an event panel, you know, you have four people up on stage talking, but the difference yes. is there's not just like this structured, like, okay, the panel, the expert is going to talk now, and then we'll take, um, mm -hmm. questions from the audience who are amateurs, right? Like it's this idea of like the, the audience is amateurs. We're on stage because we're the experts, but actually that boundaries have been completely bur bl blurred where it's like, oh, Hey, you know, uh, Elon Musk just jumped up, jumped into yes. the clubhouse and, you know, let's put him on stage. Like, so instantly you're expanding the size of the panel on the yeah. stage dynamically. Uh, there's a lot greater interactivity between the audience and the stage essentially. And yes, I think yes. that is actually really interesting because I can't really think of too many other spaces that have that, that kind of format. So I think that is, that is sort of a core innovation in, in that sense, like the um, audio, the audio social, like the audio network, basically. 
Um, so I think it's valuable. It won't go away. I mean, just like people without you know, radio would go away, you know, when TV yeah. came along, it didn't, right? You know, it just it just changed, right? You know, you have Spotify as sort of the, the modern radio station, right? Um, and so I think Clubhouse is going to be like that. It's it's going to be another alternative format for certain types of conversations, certain types of interests um, and speakers. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I think more more innovation in this space is better. I mean, you know, we've been constrained too much about what we think about how we socialize online, and we need to change that. Yeah, it's uh, exactly. I, I mean, I was uh, I was just coming. Uh, when, when I uh, when I uh, apply for Clubhouse when I get access, I was just having a, a virus, you know, COVID nineteen, and I had like two weeks to listen nonstop. You know, it was like you know overwhelmed with, with it. You know, I wanted really uh, I created the uh, group yeah. and and the club and everything, and it was then then I of course get uh, healthier luckily, and uh, it was just the digestion time. You know, how can I use you know in, in a better way? And then there's a question: Should I make a should I invite you on podcast or clubhouse or you know what should be the format to use? But yeah. only with podcast, I'm, I'm worried. Uh, one thing that I was missing, you know, how can I repeat the great talk? You know, how can I yeah, catch yeah. the momentum? Yeah. You know, <laughs> for sure. I think I think this is this is the you know the case with all new technology, especially social communication technology. Right? Is initially there's this phase of our brain grappling to figure out what box to put it in yeah, because yeah, the yeah. box doesn't exist. And so it takes time for users to actually understand how do I use this? How, where does this fit in my life in the other, the scheme of other communication tools? How do I think about it? Uh, and I think probably one of the big, you know, kind of feedback, you know, I've had to the clubhouse team is just like really like on ramps, like how do I, how do in discovery and on ramps, like how do I know what's being out there and not forget about it? Cause it's like, yeah, there's, yeah. it's kind of still hard. They don't, haven't built out the roads. I think they'll figure it out. And they have sure. to figure it out if they want to keep growing. Um, and, and that's actually been a stumbling block to, um, to them. But you know, the thing is, is like, you know, there's so, there's so many, um, you know, Twitter, the reason Twitter exploded is because it created an unfiltered, you know, kind of not always like PR free, but like pretty unfiltered voice directly to people. Yeah. And I think Clubhouse is the same thing. It's like, it's the audio version, right? Like, it's like, you know, you're used to seeing like, I don't know if you like if you follow like a sports fan or, or um, and you follow like some athlete, you know, you see them at the press conference, there's like, yeah. little high right reels and stuff, but you don't like actually get them, hear them talking about their own life very frequently or just their yeah. own opinions or get, get a sense of their personality. Like that's something that Clubhouse excels at actually, because exactly. it's unstructured, it's long, long, generally long format. Um, unlike, you know, kind of when you're on TV or something like, you know, the video editing and stuff, you got to like make things very bite sized. But with Clubhouse, it's, it's a little bit more slow and more conversational. And we're, we're social animals. So like we, we respond to that. Uh, and I think that's that we feel close. We already love these people. Now we feel closer to them. Like they're actually exactly. we feel like exactly. we're friends almost because yeah. we're, we're hearing them talk about very personal subjects sometimes. And I, yeah. I think that's, that's very compelling. And that's, that's actually, that's sort of that heart of like the things that I think social sort of, um, re, um, the next wave of social is going to be really interesting. Kind of, I call it like social sure. treatment or whatever you want to call it is going to be like that. It's more high trust, more private network, more, um, more like kind of closeness um, to people, like uh, not it, just yeah. posting content and having this uh, content economy and all about attention and, and about ads. Um, yes. I think, I think we're going to see a lot of um, innovation. I've already seen some startups doing interesting things in this space. Uh, and I'm hoping to be um, one of them, of course. <laughs> yeah. we, this way we are getting to the last animal and last uh, few minutes to, to catch up, you know, and, uh, and it's the last animal, it's a butterfly and butterfly wings from, with a uh, theory from 19th century, really old, but it's really connecting that each person, it can influence also global to make a global change. We don't have to be Kim Kardashian, you know, or, or Trump, you know, to make the influence. But actually, how would you see your superpower? Are you your uh, hyper connector or how would you call it? What keeps you, you know, going for the your toughest days? Like, in, in a way, yeah, in yeah. Superpower. Well, I'm a, I'm a very curious person. So I like meeting people from all walks of lives. And, and I think I, I was very fortunate that in early in my career, I found that, um, the most interesting people and the most interesting things tend to be at the intersection. Um, and, and, and when you can make that intersection intentional, it's really powerful. So, you know, like, you know, like I love having dinner parties at my house and I'll invite very different people to my, you know, dinner parties. And it's really fascinating to see which direction conversations go sometimes. 
because of that. And, and, and those conversations are always more interesting. Uh, and, um, you know, we see this, like, you know, actually, like, I remember I was working in the kind of academia, like, you know, seeing how Stanford with their BioX building, where they intentionally designed the building where they um, would have actually different departments would actually share physical space. So, like, your, you know, where you would get your coffee, you know, your restrooms, you know, your lunch eating places. And so they actually got cro um, um, kind of that cross-disciplinary thing, because normally in academia, everyone's in silos, they're literally in different buildings. Um, and really, that, that's where the interesting thing is, because if you have lawyers mixing with biologists, now you get bioethics, like, you know, and so like, I, I think there's, you know, you know, to some degree, like degrees and disciplines and domains, those are human constructs. Like, you know, the reality is there's a lot of messy stuff in between that actually creates whole new fields. And that's actually where the most growth is and where the most interesting things are. Uh, that's where I want to be in my career. And that's and I've intentionally try to put myself into those places. Um, because things that are cross domain, cross discipline, um, cross border, um, those things, that's always where um, you, you get a lot of um, interaction, a lot of um, exciting ideas. Um, and I, I think that's, I, I mean, I think I, I, I tend to see this in everything now, um, that the companies doing the most interesting things are the ones, um, you know, people are coming from totally naive backgrounds. And re yeah, you know, yeah. Elon Musk, I mean, he, he did, you know, software and e-commerce he's building rockets and cars now. I mean, it's like, he did, he did not go, he did not go get a, he, a, he, was a he was a rocket physicist, right? Like, I mean, it kind of, so it shows like in, in Silicon Valley is very known for that, you know, people who know nothing about space come in and actually disrupt it. Um, but I think you can do that intentional in many different ways. And, you know, Steve Jobs, a, very, a lot of famous stories too, like him, reason why you, we get the graphic interfaces because he took like a calligraphy course or like yeah, typography yeah. course in college and he, and he loved the beauty of fonts and he was really passionate about bringing beautiful fonts to screens and 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 then printing them out and and that's why we got you know the mac basically um so that that kind of intuitive leaps about where things could go you don't know where those connections will be made so i think exactly. the diversity of experience and 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 really seeking out intentionally um, different people, people not in your industry, you're probably going to have more likely to have a breakthrough and a great idea talking to those people than talking to anyone in your uh, your field who's the expert. Yeah, yeah. No, great, great uh, talk, Tim. Yeah, I would love to chat with you more, you know, but, uh, running out of time, you know, and trying to, to, to catch up as much as possible. But um, would you suggest, for the end, would you suggest somebody to, who would you like to listen to, for example? Is there any idea who would you like to nominate you know, for one of the fast forwards, you know. Oh, for like future podcast. Yes. <laughs> wow. Ah, uh, wow. Uh, such a such a uh, interesting question. Um, I would love to hear sort of more. Like, uh, so actually, I have uh, my friend uh, uh, Mark. You know, he he worked really closely with Steve Jobs and did a lot of stuff at Apple uh, and Adobe, and um, and he he started some startups. Um, you know, we worked at Square. Now he's at Slack. He's a very interesting guy, very visual guy. I always mm -hmm. love talking to him. He's a, he's a fascinating guy. There's, I could, I could probably come up with like 10 other names because wow. like, yeah. I, yeah, I have some very interesting friends, uh, but he's just someone who I've been thinking of recently and a uh, great design guy too. Great, great. I will close the, close the chat. Thank you. Thank you, team.